so now let's start with Kurt's talk, who is going to talk about power laws, fractals, and criticality. All right. Um, first, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to do this talk. Um, I wanted to do something kind of fun, um, but also since it's the Halloween season, I wanted to do something kind of spooky. So power laws are something which show up a lot. And I think that sometimes that can be a little bit spooky. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So um, to start things off, I wanna give an example. So this is a random process. And the way that you simulate this process is that you start by drawing out a set of points on a piece of paper. And then you start rolling die to figure out what pairs of points you want to connect with a line. And the question is, after doing this a few times and drawing in some lines, um, what does this resulting graph look like? Uh, in particular, I'm calling this the paperclip process because there's kind of like this isomorphic thing that shows up in a Vsauce video, which I'd highly recommend checking out uh, after this talk. So when you start looking at the graphs that can come out of this process, if you don't do anything, then the graph is totally disconnected. But also, if you make many, many, many moves, then the entire graph is going to be connected. All the points are going to be connected by lines. Um, so both cases are trivial in the sense that you either have n points and n components, or you have n points and one component. So the interesting behavior occurs somewhere in the middle where you have some random collection of edges which um, have been drawn and some that haven't been drawn. And the question that we're interested in is, well, how big do these connected components get? What is like the, the distribution on them? So we can I'm imagine- just, um, There's a question in the chat. Yeah, I can't see the chat. <laughs> it's a, I'll read it. If it says the question is, if you roll the same number, do you not draw an edge? If you roll, yeah. If you roll, if you roll the same number twice, do you weight it twice? Uh, no. In this case, you only consider distinct pairs of points. Um, if you drew an edge to itself, it's not an interesting case. I think the question is more like if you get like the same two, like the same pair twice. Oh, oh no. Um, if you get the same pair twice and the edge is already drawn, then you, you don't need to draw the additional edge. We're just interested in connecting the points. We're not interested in the number of edges or loops in the edges. We just want to see how the thing gets connected. So yeah, it's unweighted, undirected, simple. All right. So we can also, imagine you people in the audience are allowed to like ask questions out loud if you want. Yeah, if, if you need to ask a question, like I will stop much faster if you use the microphone, um, just because chat's a bit hard to see. So we, we can imagine what happens when you simulate this process. So I've drawn out the points and now I'm going to roll my imaginary die and connect the two points that I rolled, 10 and 20, you know, draw a line. So you can do this again, and you get a different pair of points. You do it again. And in particular, you can do it a few more times. And after doing this a whole bunch of times, we're interested in um, what are the sizes of these connected components? The blue edges make up a pretty big connected component, but the yellow one only has four vertices connected. The red one only has two, and the rest of these guys are lonely. So if we draw a plot which shows the size of the connected components versus their rank, so if you order them by how big their components are, you get a distribution that looks like this. Now, um, this might not be too interesting on its own, but if you plot this the same set of points on log log axes, you find that it has a bit more uh, structure here. It looks a little bit like a linear trend and 
you can imagine fitting a line to this thing. And the more points that you do this with, and if you do this over many iterations, you see that in general, they are pretty well approximated by uh, linear trend when you draw it on log log axes, where log log axes just means um, instead of plotting x versus y, I'm plotting log of x versus log of y. So this is maybe not super interesting as an example on its own, but it turns out that this kind of log log linearity occurs a lot in nature. For example, it occurs in word usage across different languages, namely every modern language that's in common use today um, obeys some version of this log-log linearity. This plot here is if you look at word usage just on Wikipedia, but a similar thing happens if you look at any kind of large body of text like um, long novels or maybe bi biblical passages. This also happens if you look at the population of United States cities. So if you rank the cities by their population, then you find that there's also this log log linear trend. And this kind of thing also happens in social networks. If you look at online discussion forums like Discord, you see a similar curve to what we saw for the random process. And sure enough, if you look at this on log log axes, you get a linear trend. This is the Stony Brook math Discord and uh, the way that I measured user activity is by using one of the bots that ranks you for how often you post. Who's the furthest dot? Who's like the smallest dot? No, the, the dot that's furthest to the left, who's that? I don't know, but whoever that guy is, he should probably like get out of the house more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Kurt, I agree. Kurt, you should have spammed a bunch to get yourself a better fit with <laughs> <laughs> the rank one line. Yeah, maybe I could have rearranged uh, the points here or something. But in any case, all of these trends where you have this kind of log-log linearity are examples of power laws. So power law is just an expression of the form y is proportional to x raised to some power. And proportionality just means that it equals this times some constant. So um, power laws always give rise to linear trends when plotted on log log axes, because if you just take the log of this expression on both sides, you see that log y is a linear function of log x. And the interesting thing is that these guys appear all over um, the natural sciences. They're known for being a really useful empirical distribution, which means that it's a curve that you can fit to data, even if you don't have like a physical formula which tells you this is the right uh, line to be drawing. It just is very useful to have in your toolbox, kind of like a linear regression. And in fact, the, the fact that you have this log-log linearity means you can estimate these relationships using linear regression. So one uh, really common case in which you see a power law is when a certain phenomena obeys Zipf's law. And all that Zipf's law says is that you have a probability distribution called a Zipf distribution somewhere in your problem. And the Zipf distribution is just given by a power law in the expression of the PDF. So if you give me some finite number of objects, then Zipf's law says that you should have a power law that describes the probability distribution over them. Um, if you take an infinite number of, of points, then you get a zeta distribution. And this gets its name from the fact that the normalization constant is just the Riemann zeta function. So if we revisit the uh, paperclip process that we started with, this thing is called a preferential attachment process, also known as a Yule process. It's preferential because every time that you connect two points with an edge, they have a greater probability of 
increasing the size of that connected component when you roll the die again. Now, to increase the size of that component, you have to roll either of these two numbers, so the probability went up. Um, and that's what makes it a preferential attachment process. These uh, processes originally came from a 1924 paper by this guy, Udni Yule. And it can be shown that if you have this kind of random process, it's going to generate some kind of zip distribution in the problem that you're looking at. You can also consider what a power law distribution looks like um, for not just discrete random variables, but also continuous ones. And you get what's called a Pareto distribution. And that's just now if you know the, the input to the PDF is a continuous variable, you get the kind of curve that you might expect. And uh, these are also useful for modeling a lot of phenomena across the social sciences and economics. In particular, it gives rise to the 80-20 rule, which is just a statement that like 80% of profits come from 20% of my customers. Uh, in general, the 80-20 rule comes from a Pareto distribution with a very specific choice of parameter. But if you generalize this rule to say that one minus P of my probability comes from P of my thing that I'm taking the distribution over, then if you can find a P that gives you this rule, then there's a theorem that says that X actually needs to be a Pareto random variable. Of course, given like this thing is um, like defined on a continuous set and things like this, like it needs to have the same support as a Pareto random variable. But if you have that and you have this statement, then you have the shape of the, uh, the shape of the distribution immediately. So all of these examples with zip and Pareto distributions give rise to these trends in the social sciences and uh, different applications that are kind of mysterious in nature. And there's different models that give rise to them like preferential attachment or um, uh, certain things that happen when you look at eigenvalues of large matrices. But in particular, I wanna focus on um, one specific way that power laws appear, which I think is a really interesting example. But before we get into that, we need to so speak like a bit about- attachment, like an example, yes. it could be just like rich people get richer. Yes, Pre preferential attachment is exactly that maxim. Okay. So um, now before we, we talk about the kind of centerpiece of this talk, um, I first need to talk a little bit about a power law in pure mathematics, in particular on the topic of fractals. So one way to define the fractal dimension of an object is to um, talk about this thing called box counting dimension, which quantifies how rough a certain fractal is. So you see pictures online of these fractals, which look like you zoom in on them infinitely deep and they have all these interesting structures to them. Box counting dimension is a way of measuring how detailed those structures are. So if you think about this thing called box counting dimension, then for any normal shape that you might want to think about, things like spheres or hyperplanes or lines or curves, the box counting dimension is typically just an integer. And it equals like the dimension of your vector space or whatever when you have that normal notion of dimension. Now, we define a fractal to be some space where the box counting dimension is not an integer anymore. And in particular, the way that we compute the box counting dimension is by looking on log log axes to determine the linear relationship between the number of boxes, uh, like these blue things here, that touch your curve as you vary the side length of the box r. So here on the right is the coastline of Britain as a classical example. And as you shrink 
the length of the box, shrinking r, the number of boxes that make contact with the curve will change. And if you look at this uh, asymptotically and you draw what the linear trend is on log log axes, that tells you the box counting dimension. So we're going to give one example of box counting dimension uh, or just computing it using the Sir Sempinski triangle or the Sierpinski gasket. In particular, this is possible because this is going to be a self-similar fractal, so we can kind of uh, do this easily. So the way that you do it is that you just start drawing boxes of various uh, side lengths and you count how many boxes make contact with your curve. So if my side length is one, I have one box that touches the gasket. If I cut those boxes in half, now I, I see three copies of the Sierpinski triangle are touching the boxes. So n of r for one half is three. Similarly, if I cut those boxes in half, I find that n of one fourth equals nine. And if we do that again, we find that n equals 27. And it's not too hard to figure out that the reason this is occurring is because we have this self-similarity in the Sierpinski gasket. Every time that I cut the box in half, I have an identical copy of the gasket in each one of the smaller squares. So you can imagine that this process will continue down indefinitely. And if I also plot these on log log axes, we're going to find that it's a perfect linear fit. And the slope of this thing is log 3 over log 2, or 1.58. And that's the fractal dimension of the Chopinski gasket. So uh, just a few more words about this. Fractals don't necessarily need to be self-similar. Um, they just need to have this kind of infinite amount of detail as you keep zooming in. And the characteristic of the fractal is that there's no point at which I can stop zooming in and I've seen everything. You can keep zooming in and you can keep seeing uh, some kind of non-trivial shapes or waviness in the curve or just anything that's not it being like a flat line. And the thing is that if you measure like fractal behavior in real life, you really have a notion of something being approximately fractal. And all that means is that when you look at um, this log log axis, that it's locally linear within some range of scales. If we think about the coastline of Britain, then if I'm looking at this shape from Alpha Centauri, then it looks like just a speck in the sky if you can even see it. So it doesn't make sense to talk about it having a dimension. It looks like a point. Similarly, if I zoom in to the size of an electron, the coastline of Britain looks like this immense ocean of points that are just disjoint in space. So it also doesn't make sense to say that has non-zero dimension. It's just a big family of points. But somewhere in between, if we do that box counting thing, you'll see a uh, like non-zero trend on the uh, log log axes. And we call that the fractal dimension with respect to the scales that we're looking at. So for the coastline of Britain, it's fractal insofar as we're looking at this thing on the map. So any questions about uh, fractal geometry or power laws before we get into? I've heard that there's like another like way of you calling the fractal dimensions, like there's different ones. Like, are they all the same? Like, are like, so like, let's say you take the fractal, like one fractal dimension of like an object, is it gonna be the same as like other ones? Like? No, not necessarily. Yeah. They can be different. It's so, it. Okay. Uh, for, for a certain class of fractals, they tend to be the same. For a lot of like the self-similar fractals, like the Koch snowflake, you will have that um, the different notions of fractal dimension coincide. So we presented box counting dimension, 
but you might also have um, like Minkowski dimension. In fact, there's there's upper and lower Minkowski dimensions. Um, there's like a Hausdorff dimension. But for a lot of fractals that you might be thinking about normally, they should coincide. For more like pathological examples, they might not coincide. Um, so it really depends on how crazy you want to get. Because thinking about stuff like manifolds or smooth curves, you have like topological dimension, which is like well-defined. And if you think about rougher curves, you have like different versions of fractal dimension. And you can imagine that when the different versions of fractal dimension start to disagree, that your curve is getting kind of wild. Okay, thanks. Most of them do kind of um, have similar rules of definition though, where you're looking at some kind of relationship to scaling versus volume as this thing becomes like infinitely small. All right. So now a, a really interesting place where fractal geometry and power laws come up in a non-trivial way is in the topic of self-organized criticality. So to, to define this first, we need to start with what is criticality. So in dynamical systems and in physics, a critical point is a, a, a point or a state that lies at the boundary between two phases or like uh, regions that have different rules for behavior. If you think about like what a critical point is in chemistry, it's a temperature at which if you go a bit below, you're gonna have um, liquid water, but if you go a bit higher, you're gonna have water vapor. And these two things have different um, like physical behavior. Water vapor is moving around and it can um, fill up uh, volumes arbitrarily well. It doesn't like take the shape of its container unless it's enclosed in the container. While water does this other thing where it'll sink to the bottom and it is much more like uh, um, it, it, it has different um, properties in terms of what you can dissolve in water versus what like will diffuse into air. So the point is that the two phases of matter have different behavior. And this is the same idea behind criticality, is that you're at a point in um, what, what's called a, like a state space or a phase space, which is how you're representing um, what your dynamical system is doing. And if you move in one direction, you're going to get one set of behaviors. But if you move in a different direction, you're going to get a different a different set of behaviors. And it's kind of like having a ball on top of a hill where um, it could go one way and it'll end up in one region, maybe rolling around on a shallow slope. Or if it goes another way, maybe it will go off somewhere here and do something different. So that's the notion of criticality, is that you can have a point like this that's at the boundary between two phases. Now, self-organized criticality is a bit weirder. If criticality is a ball on top of the hill, self-organized criticality is the ball rolling itself back up the hill. So if you look at an example like this, it seems a little bit weird to imagine that such a thing does exist. And sure enough, before people started talking about this, self-organized criticality did seem like a really weird property for some kind of dynamical system or physical system to have. So to get some context, we're going to take a close look at the paper that first introduced this terminology. So in 1987, there was a paper by Bach, Tong, and Weissenfeld that considered a specific class of cellular automata, which are um, kind of inspired by um, sand piles. So if you imagine like 
an hourglass and you look inside the hourglass. You have a pile of sand at the basin of the hourglass and as sand grains drop down onto the basin, onto the sand pile, it will start distributing the sand grains. Sometimes the grains will sit at the top and nothing interesting happens, but other times you'll start an avalanche inside of the hourglass and the grains will redistribute themselves. And so this, this uh, contrast between redistribution and no behavior is related to this idea of criticality. So the cellular automata that uh, Bach, uh, Tang and Weissenfeld had, also known as uh, BTW, is that you imagine an infinite checkerboard or finite checkerboard, and at each time step, you drop a grain of sand onto a square of the checkerboard. Now, if the number of uh, grains of sand on that square of the checkerboard exceeds a certain threshold, then we say that the sand pile has gotten too big at that point and it needs to topple and this grains of sand will go to its neighboring points. So I have a formal description of this um, for the sake of simulation, but I think it's a bit more clear if I just look at some pictures. So um, first we start with a grid of pixels. Um, because that's easier to simulate than whatever a virtual checkerboard needs to look like. So first you drop one grain of sand and I represent that with a red square. If you drop two grains of sand onto one square, we represent that in blue. If you drop three grains, we represent that in yellow. And if we drop four grains, then um, we're gonna represent that in white. But the thing is that for the simulation that uh, I'm going to be showing you, we consider a threshold of four. So if you have four or more grains of sand on a particular square of your checkerboard, that point becomes unstable. And to stabilize the point, we need to topple the sand pile at that point and distribute uh, the grains of sand to its neighbors. So this thing will collapse and give one grain of sand to each of its neighbors represented in red. So now we can imagine doing this uh, in simulation. So if you start running the simulations for this thing, you'll get pictures that look like this. And to understand them, we have to, um, it's not letting me touch the video. I have to come over here. So what's going on in the simulation is that first it drops one grain of sand onto a fixed point. Next, it drops two. Next, it drops three. And then finally, it gets four grains of sand on that one square. The square is now unstable. It needs to stabilize. So it's going to distribute those grains of sand to its neighbors. So then we start this process again, dropping more grains of sand until it becomes unstable. It's, we topple the sand pile. Now it distributed another set of grains of sand. So now there's two on each of these neighboring points. If you do this again, now all the neighboring points have three. Do this again, now we have an unstable point here. So it's going to topple and share its points with its neighbors. Now all of its neighbors have four, point, four grains of sand. So they're also going to topple. And now we have a more interesting pattern emerge. In particular, the original point where the grains of sand were coming from, once again, now has a full sand pile on its hands. So it needs to topple a second time. And it's not letting me control the video there. So just running through the video, it's going through. Topples, topples. And now the middle point toppled and it distributed those points with its neighbors. So the, the small scale pictures are cute, but it gets more interesting the uh, larger we make the simulation. So I'm gonna consider where I keep dropping grains of sand onto a fixed point. 
and I'm going to see um, what the stabilized distribution looks like. So there's no white squares. I'm only plotting the uh, images after the distribution stabilized. So now, the more grains of sand that I add, you can see more and more interesting pictures start to emerge. You see these triangular shapes that start to appear in the sand pile. And it seems like every time I add another set of grains of sand, we're zooming in on this picture, which has almost like constant behavior. And so the pictures for just, I think I had like 2,000 or 4,000 grains of sand here, look interesting enough. But you get even cooler pictures if you start to run it with even bigger numbers. If I run it with 400,000 grains of sand, you'll get something like this. And if you run it with 1 million grains of sand, you'll get something like this. And in particular now, you can start to see there's like structure in between these triangle structures. And you can see that it just continues down infinitely into this blurry picture in the middle. But as we keep adding grains of sand into the model, this thing is going to keep inflating and giving us more and more detail. So uh, is this a periodic thing? Or like, does that have nothing to do with it? Um, are you, what would you mean by periodicity here? So like, for example, like if you like talk about like locally, like is the pattern gonna be the same? Like if you go to an outer region, is the pattern gonna be the same as it was in the inner region? With respect to the scale of the simulation, um, the answer is kind of. So, of course, this is happening on a checker grid with rotational symmetries. And in particular, all the rules that we use to define the automata have this rotate by 90 degrees, and all the rules and dynamics are the same. So you see that this thing has um, rotational symmetry if you rotate by multiples of 90 degrees. Another symmetry occurs when you start zooming in and you see that the replicating pattern of triangles is also repeated. But it's not like a perfect repeat because you can see that some of these triangles have lines that are crossing them. And what those lines are is that they're like a cascade of sand grains moving like a wave across these triangular regions. And so um, you can see that these lines look different um, for like the different rings of triangles that you look down. Um, if I look at like this one, it has like a box in the middle. But if I go one layer down, it has just a vertical line. Another layer down, it has nothing. So these kinds of like waves or striations across the triangles um, do look different at different levels. But yeah, so like another way of putting my question was being like, if you're talking about like that kind of like waves pattern, right? Is yeah. that like something that you can like predict? Or is it like not like until you simulate it, then you can predict it? You can only predict it really after simulation because it's kind of a chaotic process. If you look in the middle, everything is blurry um, and extremely hard to make out uh, an honest picture of what's going on. And it's only after the grains of sand have translated out to the far reaches of the picture that you start to see this organization emerge. So it's really hard to figure out what the like um, mapping is between um, n equals n plus one here and these lines emerging over here. All right, cool. It's I mean, it, it's possible that somebody figured that out, but I, I do not think that's an easy problem. All right. So this is a cool picture, um, but it's a little bit different than the model, or it's a little bit different than the behavior that um, BTW were originally considering. In particular, they wanted to know about how this set of dynamics, the, <clears throat> this sand pile model where if I drop grains of sand and it redistributes itself, 
they wanted to know how this thing behaves with respect to random configurations. So if you imagine that you take your sandbox now and you fill it up with sand in random distributions all over, everything is well above the threshold, and then you let this thing stabilize, well, some sand is gonna fall off the table, but that's fine, that's part of the model. And eventually you'll have some random distribution of sand that covers the whole table. Now, what uh, BTW were interested in was what do avalanches look like in this sand pile? So an avalanche is a sequence of topplings that happen after you've only added one grain of sand. In the video that I showed before, there was one case where we dropped a grain of sand and it toppled a pile, and then those piles toppled, and then another pile toppled. And that's an avalanche of size three. So they wanted to know how the uh, sizes of different avalanches um, were in probability, what's the distribution on them. And they also wanted to know what the um, average lifetime is of an avalanche, which is just the, um, like, number of toppling generations. So if you have multiple like white points in this picture, you can topple those all in one move. And so that one move is one year in the avalanche's lifetime. And so you look at how many of those moves you need to stabilize the distribution, and that gives you an avalanche lifetime. And the avalanche size is just the overall number of topplings that you have. So what BTW found was that you have a power law that appears in the distribution of avalanche sizes and lifetimes. Plotted on log lock axes, you get a linear trend. And in particular, um, this is interesting because it's not limited by the um, dynamics of the process itself. The only thing that determines the extent of this power law or like the size of the axes is how big you make the simulation. If I make the simulation um, 1 million times bigger, I might have 10 to the 6 here, but you'll still see a power law emerge in this process. So that's cool that there's a power law here, but is there a significance to that? Well, recall from our discussion on fractal dimension that the characteristic of a fractal is that it's like it has invariant or, or non-trivial behavior under any scale that you look at. As you keep scaling up the model, you will continually have more and more intricate detail appear. And that's really a result of the power law, is the fact that no matter how big uh, I make this model, I'm always going to have some non-zero stuff at very small scales. And so if you imagine what that means with respect to this image, as I scale up this big sand pile, I'm always going to have some kind of non-trivial shapes and clusters and weird chaotic patterns in the middle of the sand pile. It doesn't matter how big the simulation gets, that, uh, that behavior is never going to iron itself out and make a cohesive kind of picture. And so that's a characteristic of fractal geometry. When you render a picture of the Mandelbrot, you only have a finite number of pixels to do it. But if you scale up that simulation, you get a more detailed pictures, a more detailed picture of the Mandelbrot set. And if you scale that up, you get even more detail. And the same thing is happening here, where you have this, I can keep scaling it up and keep seeing more interesting stuff come out of the model. And that's a characteristic of fractal geometry. And the last thing to note about this model is that the fact that you can keep scaling up and it still has behavior also means that there's of course, avalanches that are still occurring because that's what we're measuring here. And it's a little bit weird to think that this 
random process. I drop a grain of sand into the sandbox, it stabilizes itself. It's weird to think that after it stabilizes, it's still going to um, react non-trivially to a new grain of sand. So you can imagine a sandbox like this, and I drop another grain of sand, and it has an avalanche of 100 particles, you know, 100 topplings in that process. The fact that that can happen means that it was at a critical point, but it's also self-organized because the sand pile is putting itself in the position to react to that way to new grains of sand being added. And so this is really where um, this notion of self-organized criticality comes from, is the fact that the sand pile is reacting to a, to, um, a perturbation, just one grain of sand, but it's doing it in a very chaotic way and also arranges itself in a position to do that again the next time you add another perturbation or random grain of sand. So just a few more fun facts about this model. This actually gives rise to a certain abelian group called the sand pile group, and that has some interesting algebraic properties that are beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. Also, self-organized criticality is really relevant to stuff that's going on in theoretical neuroscience. And the neural criticality hypothesis is this postulate that the brain is somehow using uh, self-organized criticality in its own dynamics to improve its computational efficiency. And in particular, if you think about how data is encoded in neural networks, you also see this kind of thing happen uh, in, in accordance to a power law. But these are some things that I felt were kind of outside the scope of this talk to really get into the nitty gritty with. And if you're curious about any of the references, I included them here. I think that a lot of these papers and videos are pretty accessible. Thank you, Kurt, for this awesome talk. Are there any questions?